Hi, this is Destiny from The Book Clinic. In a previous video, I talked about how necessary it is to have an interesting protagonist who audiences can sympathize with and root for. But you'll be hard pressed to give depth to a character who doesn't change, or at least have the opportunity to change over the course of a story. So how do you create a character arc? In this video, we'll discover the four essential ingredients to creating a character arc. Then we're gonna take a look at David Fincher's The Social Network and see how screenwriter Aaron Sorkin has marked a compelling, if tragic, evolution. Let's jump in. According to K.M. Wyland, there are four essential ingredients to creating a character arc. A lie, an external want or desire, an internal need, and a ghost or wound. Let's dig into what each of these mean and how they function. Every character needs to have a flaw or false belief that is holding them back. Wyland calls this the lie your character believes. Your character is incomplete on the inside. He is harboring some deeply held misconception about either himself, the world, or probably both. From the very first scene of The Social Network, it is clear Mark is insecure and unfulfilled. His lie is that he believes self-worth comes from status, from distinguishing oneself, from being special. In a well-constructed character arc, the character is aware on some level that something is missing from their life, that there is a hole that needs to be filled. Their mistake comes in trying to fix an internal problem with an external solution. The heart of a character arc is the battle between a character's want and their need. The lie plays out in your character's life and your story through the conflict between the thing he needs, the truth, and the thing he wants, the perceived cure for the symptoms of the lie. So let's see how this applies to the social network specifically. To recap, Mark originally wants to prove his worth by joining a final club. When he doesn't get punched, he decides to invent something so amazing the final clubs will wish they had accepted him. He invents Facebook and becomes obsessed with making it successful and extraordinarily popular. This is his want, but it's not what he really needs. The thing your character needs is usually going to be nothing more than a realization. In some stories, this realization may change nothing about his external life, but it will always transform his perspective of himself and the world around him, leaving him more capable of coping with his remaining external problems. Mark needs to stop being selfish and value his connections with other people. This is established perfectly in the opening, where we see Mark's insecurities spoil his relationship with his girlfriend. Let's break down this scene. You know there are more people with genius IQs living in China than there are people of any kind living in the United States? That can't possibly be true. It is. Who would account for that? Well, first, an awful lot of people live in China, but here's my question. How do you distinguish yourself in a population of people who all got 1,600 on their SATs? Mark's first question is, how do you distinguish yourself in a population where everyone got 1,600 on their SATs? For his entire life, Mark has been special because he's super smart probably the smartest in his family and one of the smartest in his high school. He needs to feel special. And now that he's in a population of people just as smart or smarter than him, he's no longer special. I didn't know they take SATs in China. They don't. I wasn't talking about China anymore. I was talking about me. You got a 1600? Yes. I could sing in an acapella group, but I can't sing. Does that sing. mean you actually got nothing wrong? I could row crew or invent a $25 PC. Or you get into a final club? Or I get into a final club. You know, from a woman's perspective, sometimes not singing in an acapella group is a good thing. This is serious. On the other hand, I do like guys who wrote crew. Well, 
I can't do that. His girlfriend makes a joke about liking guys who row crew, and Mark's demeanor completely changes. She's unintentionally hit him where it hurts most. He's not athletic, he's not popular, and he's not cool. Mark's response to this perceived slight tells us all we need to know about him. I can't do that. I was kidding. Yes, I got nothing wrong with the test. Have you ever tried? I'm trying right now. To row crew? To get into a final club. To row crew? No, are you like, whatever, delusional? First, he flexes about his SAT score, saying he got nothing wrong on the test. Then, he suddenly changes the subject back to final clubs. When his girlfriend still thinks he's talking about crew, he mocks her. Maybe it's just sometimes you'd say two things at once, I'm not sure which one I'm supposed to be aiming at. But you've seen guys who were crew, right? No. Okay, well, they're bigger than me. They're world-class athletes. And a second ago, you said you like guys who were crew, so I assumed you had met one. I guess I just meant I like the idea of it, you know, the way a girl likes cowboys. Okay. Should we get something to eat? Would you like to talk about something else? No. It's just since the beginning of the conversation about finals club, I I think I may have missed a birthday. He asks if she wants to talk about something else. And despite her response making it obvious that she does, he continues to talk about final clubs. There are really more people in China with genius IQs than the entire The Phoenix population. is the most diverse. The Fly Club, Roosevelt Punch the Pork. Which one? The Porcellian, the Pork, it's the best of the best. Which Roosevelt? Theodore. Is it true that they send a bus around to pick up girls who want to party with the next Fed chairman? So you can see why it's so important to get in. Okay, well, which is the easiest to get into? Why would you ask me that? I was just asking. None of them. That's the point. My friend Eduardo made $300,000 betting oil futures one summer, and Eduardo won't come close to getting in. The ability to make money doesn't impress anybody around here. Must be nice. He made $300,000 in a summer? He likes meteorology. You said it was oil futures. You can read the weather, you can predict the price of heating oil. I think you asked me that because you think the final club that's easiest to get into is the one where I'll have the best chance. I... What? You asked me which one was the easiest to get into because you think that that's the one where I'll have the best chance. The one that's the easiest to get into would be the one where anybody has the best chance. You didn't ask me which one was the best one, you asked me which one was the easiest one. I was honestly just asking, okay? I was just asking to ask. When she asks which is the easiest to get into, his face completely falls. He automatically assumes she's inferring that he could only get into the easiest club and takes it as a slight. Mark also states that he doesn't think Eduardo has a chance of getting in, setting up the jealousy and disappointment that consumes him when Eduardo later gets punched by a prestigious final club. The scene builds up to his climax, where Mark states the lie that he believes. I didn't mean to be cryptic. I'm just saying I need to do something substantial in order to get the attention of the clubs. Why? Because they're exclusive and fun, and they lead to a better life. Then, he condescendingly offers to take her to parties once he gets in so she can meet people she wouldn't normally get to meet. Mark feels less than, and rather than do any internal soul searching, he projects onto Erica and implies that he's better than her and even assumes the only reason they were able to get into this exclusive bar is because she slept with the doorman. The door guy, his name is Bobby. I have not slept with the door guy. The door guy is a friend of mine and he's a perfectly good class of people. And what part of Long Island are you from? Wimbledon? Wait. I'm going back to wait, my door. Wait, wait, is this real? Yes. Okay, then wait, I apologize, okay? I have to go study. Erica? Yes. I'm sorry, I mean it. I appreciate that, but I have to go study. Come on, you don't have to study, you don't have to study, let's just talk. I can't. Why? Because it is exhausting. Dating you is like dating a stairmaster. All I meant is that you're not likely to... Currently. I wasn't making a comment on your parents, I was just saying that you go to BU, I was stating a fact, that's all, and if it seemed rude, then of course I apologize. I have to go study. You don't have to study. Why do you keep saying I don't have to study? Because you go to BU. He belittles her education, showing the audience that his response when he feels threatened or insecure is to lash out at those closest to him. With Mark's fragile ego on full display, Erica rightfully breaks up with him. His lie has cost him one of only two real connections in his life. This scene establishes Mark's ghost or wound, which Wyland describes as something in your character's past that haunts him and is usually the cause of the lie. In the social network, Mark's ghost is his girlfriend breaking up with him. 
Sorkin shakes up this formula a little bit here because Mark believes his lie before his ghost comes into the picture. But the breakup is what tortures Mark and causes him to double down on his pursuit of success throughout the film. This opening scene has not only told us Mark's flaws, the lie that he believes, his want, his need, and his ghost, but also hints at the direction his character arc will take. I've read some articles saying that Mark doesn't change in the social network, but that isn't true. But while most character arcs change for the better over the course of the story, Mark regresses. He has a negative character arc. In a negative change arc, the lie is about something the character already possesses but devalues, i.e. he's already filthy rich, but he fails to value or be responsible with his blessings. There will be one specific, objectively good thing in his life that he will take for granted. Worse, he will be willing to sacrifice this good thing and its inherent truth in order to pursue the false promise of the lie. We see this in the opening scenes of the film. Mark doesn't value the people in his life and takes his best friend Eduardo Saverin for granted. Hey Mark, uh, I need a dedicated Linux box running Apache with a minus zero back end. It's going to cost a little more money. How much more? How about 200 more? Do we need it? Gotta handle the traffic. Do it. Already did. Wylan lists three types of negative character arcs. The disillusionment arc, the corruption arc, and the fall arc. And Mark falls into the last one. The fall arc follows this pattern. Character believes lie, clings to lie, rejects new truth, believes stronger, worse lie. So let's see how this plays out in the social network. We've already seen how firmly Mark believes his lie. But unlike in a positive change arc, Mark rejects every opportunity to change and embrace the truth. Directly after getting dumped, Mark writes a vitriolic post on his blog, deriding his ex-girlfriend's family, her bra size, and her education. His first opportunity to stop being selfish and value the connections he has comes when his best friend Eduardo offers his support after the breakup. Done. Hey, what's going on? Perfect timing. Eduardo's here and he's going to have the key ingredient. Hey, Mark. Eduardo. You and Erica split up. How did you know that? It's on your blog. Yeah. Are you alright? I need you. I'm here for you. No, I need the algorithm you used to rank chess players. Are you okay? We're ranking girls. You mean other students? Yeah. You think this is such a good idea? I need the algorithm. All right. I need the algorithm. Give each girl a base rating of 1,400. At any given time, girl A has a rating RA and girl B has a rating R. But Mark chooses to ignore him and instead asks him for his algorithm to make the website that would be the precursor to Facebook, FaceMatch. He doesn't appreciate Eduardo's kindness. He's only interested in using him to further his goals and this usury only escalates over the course of the film. About 20 minutes in, Mark is given the chance to form a partnership with the Winklevoss twins and their friend Divya, but these men are everything Mark wishes he was. Popular, athletic, cool, and members of a final club, and he resents them for it. So Mark rejects these new connections and instead steals their idea. I know some people might say that the Winklevoss twins aren't likable or that they're douchebags and so Mark wasn't wrong in stealing their idea or in choosing not to partner with them. But that is beside the point. Mark had a chance to make a new connection, to make some new friends, and instead he decides to screw them over. Again, because he can't be honest with himself, he lashes out at those around him. Another opportunity to change comes when Mark approaches Eduardo with his idea for Facebook and his friend reveals that he's been punched by the Phoenix. The setting in the scene is important as the lame party thrown by the Jewish fraternity is exactly the type of thing Mark wants to escape. 
Mark could decide to support his friend and be happy for him, but Mark feels left behind and instead projects his insecurities onto others and lashes out as usual. I said, let's do it. Okay, did he add anything else? Yes. It probably was a diversity thing. But so what? Throughout the film, he continually asks Eduardo for increasingly large amounts of money to fund his business operation, but completely ignores his input. While Eduardo feels that making pitches to advertisers and monetizing the site is the best way to go, Mark is obsessed with keeping the site cool and so shuts down his propositions. Mark desperately wants to connect with people. It's the underlying reason why he invents Facebook in the first place. Rather than learning a lesson from being rejected by his girlfriend in the first scene, it instead leaves him clinging even more firmly to his lie. That was the right thing to do. You apologized, right? We have to expand. Mark? Mark's moral downfall is practically sealed when he meets Sean Parker, the founder of Napster, and someone Mark idolizes as the epitome of cool. Sean is Mark's lie incarnate. Mark doesn't see what the audience sees, that Mark is a has-been and a loose cannon who's almost ruined every company he founded and whose only hope of success is riding on Mark's coattails. All he sees are the shiny trappings of Sean's life, the expensive bottles of liquor, the exclusive clubs, the Victoria's Secret models on his arm, and so forth. It helps that Sean only tells Mark what he wants to hear. So Mark, choosing Sean over Eduardo, distancing his best friend from the company's operations, freezing him out of meetings, and eventually flat out betraying him, is Mark choosing the embodiment of his lie over the embodiment of his truth. He decides that being special, distinguished, and cool is more important than friendship or connection. What is genius about this film is Mark ends the movie getting everything he wants. Facebook is ridiculously successful and popular, and he's become a household name. Even the money he has to shell out for the settlements are nothing more than a few drops in the bucket. But he's lonely, miserable, and completely by himself. Still unfulfilled, still empty, still longing for connection. Though the film is focused on Mark, I like the fact that Eduardo also has a character arc. However, his growth is positive. He finally realizes his blind loyalty is unwise and learns how to stand up for himself. For most of the film, Eduardo is supremely patient and supportive. He does whatever Mark asks him to do despite Mark's glaring lack of respect for him. Even standing outside in 20 degree weather wearing nothing but Hawaiian shirt and shorts because Mark asked him to. While loyalty is a positive trait, Eduardo's is extreme enough to be a flaw. He gives Mark loyalty he hasn't earned, unless his friend use him as a doormat. Eduardo's relationship with Christy illustrates his unfounded loyalty and his pushover attitude. Despite it literally taking her trying to set his room on fire to get him to break up with her, doing so is one of the first signs of his evolution. The tragic part is Eduardo grows his spine a little too late. Sean already has his claws deep in Mark, so when Eduardo freezes the Facebook bank account to get Mark's attention, Mark sees Eduardo as an obstacle in the way of him accomplishing his want. Rather than apologizing and treating his friend and CFO with respect, Mark cuts him out of the company, destroying his only real friendship. I was your only friend. So, Mark gets what he wants at the end, but not what he needs, and therefore he's still miserable with no girlfriend, no friends, nothing tangible. There's a juxtaposition of his success with his personal life at the end, and the movie closes with him constantly refreshing the page, waiting to see if his ex-girlfriend Erica will respond to his friend request. Did you think your novel was ready for publication only to receive a mountain of rejection letters or bad reviews? Have you poured your heart and soul into your story, but something isn't quite working and you don't know how to fix it? 
The best thing you can do is have a professional take a critical look at your manuscript. And that's where the book clinic comes in. I offer developmental editing, copy editing, and proofreading services, as well as an agent prep package to give you everything you need to start querying. I will not only help you write a compelling and engaging story, but I use my experience as a publishing industry insider to give you the advice you need to make an agent fall in love with your manuscript. If you're interested, check us out at bookclinicnyc.com. Let me bring the best out of your book.